Hello and welcome to today's podcast. My guest is John Menners Bell. He is a renowned logistics professional professor. I met him some 20 years ago um, and uh, uh, he will be talking about the importance, surprisingly, also of written skills and written communication to deliver passionately your message and conveying it in a, in a convincing way. And also here we'll be talking about the wide range of different opportunities in the logistics industry and how important it is to really have a 360 view and understanding in order to determine as a young professional where to start and what to do. Enjoy today's podcast. Good morning, John. It's a pleasure to have you on Learning with Leaders today. Good morning, Paco. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, to you uh, next half hour with you. Me too. Thank you very much. John, may I quickly introduce you to the audience? Uh, by the way, I think it's something like almost 20 years that the last time we have actually worked together. Um, and it was at the time when the Eastern European countries were integrated into the EU, if I remember well. So, in a few words, um, I know that you are not only a logistics theorist and lecturer, but that you also are actually working in the logistics arena. So this is your passion uh, since a lot of years uh, on an international basis, of course. Uh, you're working um, with a lot of young people as well. So is there anything you would like to add to this very quick introduction? Well, I think that uh, that says it about all, uh, Paco. I've been working in the industry since, uh, well, I, I started with my father's uh, road freight company and freight forwarding company back in the uh, 1980s. And so uh, I've had probably about 35, uh, five years or so experience. And uh, there's been some uh, enormous changes over that uh, over that period of uh, time, not least uh, when we first met, uh, when the uh, Eastern European companies countries were joining the EU which of course had huge implications uh, for the for the logistics industry but now I write a lot about the the global supply chains uh, about ethics about supply chain risk as well as what's happening in, in the industry and of course as, as you know and all our viewers will know that um, the, the logistics and supply chain industry has never been so much in the public eye as it is today. I mean, every almost every sort of media report you see has uh, talks about supply chain in terms of the impact that uh, uh, that supply chain disruption is having on uh, on the holiday period on, on Christmas. Uh, before that, it was on PPE and on COVID nineteen, etc., and driver shortages. So it's such a relevant I I issue today. So we may think that visibility uh, also for talent attraction might not be, let's say, an issue, but let's talk about that later, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, now I would like to, let's say, propel you into the beginnings of your career, which honestly, I can't believe that it might be 35 years ago or something. Um, were there any, let's say, um, aha moment, uh, any really like a light bulb moment for you uh, from a, let's say, coaching or mentoring uh, perspective, which really had a significant impact on your career? Yes, I th well, I think um, it probably came in my mid-20s when I started uh, talking a lot about the industry uh, and not just uh, operating within it. Uh, so uh, I'd, I'd already been an operations manager for for some some time uh, and worked in finance and worked in marketing. And then, then I started talking, presenting not just about the company I was working for, but also on various issues relating to the industry. And I think the what you call the aha moment is was happened when I really understood that how to engage people uh, was to stimulate them uh, rather than just continue with just talking to them. And I, I think at that point I understood because, I and it comes through confidence, I, I think, Paco, that um, to begin with, and a, a lot of people, I, I suppose, watching this will, will have the same experiences. You know, you stand up on a stage and you see a, a, an audience in front of you and all you want to do is to get through your presentation or, and, uh, and, and get out without, without making a, a mess of it. And, um, and and that's as far as your ambition 
emotions go. But as soon as you become more confident, you realize actually um, what I'm saying should be of interest to everybody uh, in, the, in the audience. But then really the next stage is how do you engage them? How do you stimulate them? And, and I think at that point, fr from that confidence, you actually grow into being a much more effective trainer when when you start looking at it from the perspective of the people in the audience rather than just trying to deliver a mass of information as quickly as you possibly can and then get out of the room and I, I think that's 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 how and I think the light bulb moment came earlier but then the confidence to be able to to do that to actually start engaging to ask people in the audience what what they felt and uh, what their experiences were and to look at people within the audience as individuals rather than just a sort of mass of faces then uh, I, I, I think so uh, I guess that's really where I became a more effective trainer than than before I fully understand that. And uh, talking about, especially when you are younger, uh, lacking of confidence um, without putting you the, the words into the mouth. Um, so when you look at your students, uh, which obviously are mostly young, young, young people, um, what are they lacking most when they uh, have their degree and go into, let's say, the real world, the real professional world? Yeah, well, I think uh, if they've been on, on, a, on a good degree course, they will have had all the foundations for, the, for, for their, their future career in terms of their knowledge uh, of the industry. Obviously, they're going to gain experience after that, and you can only gain experience by actually doing rather than having been taught. But I, I think when I look at uh, students today, I think the area that they could really improve on is their communication skills. And I think that's that's not stressed enough during uh, during the degree courses or any training, really. It's their presentation skills, because so many people, um, whatever role or function that you have, whether it's in finance or whether it's in operations or or whatever or, or marketing, you know, they need these skills to be able to present what they're thinking, uh, maybe the project they're working on. Uh, and if they're not able to do that, so they can't get these key messages across. And so uh, so their messages will be lost. So they need those communication skills, which is partly to do with being able to stand up. It might, well, it might be in front of five people. It might be in front of 50 people. But they need to be able to uh, be able to de deliver effective messages, uh, not waffle too much, be able to distill down the key, key messages, key issues as far as they're concerned, and then get those across. But not only that, in terms of communication, they're writing, uh, writing skills. And this is where I think uh, over the last 20, 30 years, there has been real issues that people don't value writing skills. Uh, you know, maybe it's a, it goes right all the way back to your know, high school and, and before that, you know, they haven't developed the skills to be able to uh, effectively deliver messages you know they may not think it's important but it is really important when you want to when you you feel something you feel passionately about it you want to get that message across but maybe you don't have those skills so so i would say communication in terms of presentation but also written skills hugely important and if you haven't got those you need to address them and, and that that's something which i often say to students you know you have to be your, your own critic. You need to find out which skills are lacking. And then if there's a writing, whether it's communication or something else, maybe it's financial skills, then you need to uh, uh, augment those. You know, you don't get to the end of your course and then say, right, that's it, I'm done. You know, it's all about lifelong learning, um, how you develop your career, uh, identify your weaknesses and do something about it. Yeah, so self-reflection as well is a very important uh, uh, key skill in order to understand what is really missing and lacking and also accepting that even after so many years of studying, you need to continue to study, right? You need to Absolutely. continue to learn. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah. So um, during your lectures, um, and I mean, I, I guess you also touch upon a, a lot of, you know, designing supply chains and all the, the, the technicalities 
of of this uh, profession, which are a lot. Um, so when, because you mentioned in the very beginning uh, the term ethics. Mm. So how do your students react when they, for the first time, are confronted with that part of their studies? Well, I, th I think a lot of people, in fact, most people, I would say, think that uh, ethics is is something that a uh, that doesn't really apply to them because they can't see uh, the relevance to to their everyday. Everybody has a has a, an idea about ethics, and most people uh, will live a life um, according to some sort of uh, ethical program or ethical thought thinking. You know that that's not the issue here. But they what they don't understand is that. Uh, in their everyday life, they are they are making decisions which impact on people on the other side of the world. And it's difficult for people to understand that. So one of the first things that I do when I'm talking about supply chain ethics is uh, as, as I make everybody, um, uh, I ask everybody, you know, who here has a smartphone in their pocket? And of course, everybody does. So they, they hold up their smartphone. And I, I said, well, do you understand the relevance of, uh, of an ethical supply chain to this? And of course, people don't. But as soon as I start pointing out that uh, many of the key components within that supply chain, uh, many of the key elements, whether it's uh, tin, ton, uh, titanium or tungsten or some of these other uh, rare elements which uh, can only be mined in maybe some parts of Africa or the, or, or the Congo, then they start thinking. And then I say, well, do you have any understanding of the conditions of those the people being who are mining? Uh, often they are, you know, absolutely dreadful environment um, they are they are paid next to nothing the, the, uh, they often their employers are uh, sort of rebel stroke terrorist groups which are uh, are making huge amounts of money out of that and deslabilizing the government of, of the country um, and then of course there are the environmental impacts of, of, of water use and uh, deforestation and so on and so forth so uh, so and that me that makes it far more relevant to the, to the students when they start understanding that, uh, that you know that, that they are part of the, of the problem as it were they're not just passive bystander looking at and saying, saying oh that's dreadful you know they've actually bought a, a phone and so they are in some small way still contributing to many of those supply chain issues and it's not just uh, smartphones you could say the same with fast fashion you know everybody who's shopped and bought and say you know bought a, um, a shirt for five dollars you have to understand that, that you know that five dollars doesn't go far you know by the time you've taken the transportation into account and the, the materials into account the the people who are actually manufacturing that that shirt you know will get a tiny proportion uh, of it you know and so consequently it, it, it's i really believe in stimulating people engaging people to understand of the implications of their decisions and how it affects supply chains mm. So obviously you don't, uh, you are not Harry Potter and you have a magic wand and in your lectures you claim to be able to change the world, but at least you try to stimulate their, their thinking around their topic. I, I, absolutely. You know, I have a smartphone. I'm, you know, wearing, wearing clothes and, and, you know, everybody is part of this issue. But if, but, but the very few people understand the full implications of uh, that global supply chains can have, whether, you know, it's fast fashion, whether it's, i uh, give you uh, another example, you know, everybody's talking about electric vehicles now. Uh, where is the, the, where are the components being mined for those batteries? You know, the, the lithium, which is being mined, you know, there are huge issues are over uh, illegal land appropriation, for example, in parts of the, of the world. There's such a huge demand for this mineral. Now there's so much money being made out of it. You know, you have to think about all the implications for the people who lived on the, those lands who are now losing that land potentially then you're, you're looking at the environmental issues as, as well and all the um, the uh, toxic toxic chemicals which are being used in the process of of many of the uh, elements which end up in in, in a battery so 
Although um, people say, yes, we must have electric vehicles uh, to reduce carbon emissions, it's the case, OK, but there are still other implications. There are still consequences uh, with throughout the supply chain which need to be thought through. It's not a, a nil sum game here. It's not some, um, you know, everybody will benefit from electric vehicles. You know, the environment in different parts of the world will uh, will be affected. So will people. So will people involved in the in the mining, the extraction as well. Uh, and there are so many other issues which people need to think about in the round. Mm. So I don't hope that business reality eats ethics for breakfast. But um, coming to my next question, where do you think um, a future supply chain professional? Uh, should focus on to be really successful in in that profession well i think if they are uh, yeah pe people coming out of maybe coming out of university or, or, or not as the case may may many successful people come through diff different routes uh, into the industry but the one common denominator i think for people to be successful really needs uh, to, that sort of passion and dedication to to the industry to understand not only their own function you know that's that's something which is uh, your, your first first step along the pathway to become a good at what you're doing, but also to look look around you. You know, if you're working in the warehouse operations of a of a logistics company, you know, you should be looking at you know what's happening in finance or what's happening in the marketing or what's happening in the sales. How does it all work? How do I fit into into this? And outside of that, you know, within you know, obviously logistics is, is um, my industry. You know, there are so many different parts of it. You have the you have the warehousing, but you then have the road freight, and you have the freight forwarding. You have the shipping lines. You have the air freight. You know, you can go on and on, and there are so many different subsections. And so, I would really encourage everybody to uh, to get a three hundred and sixty view of of the industry. And how you're affected by different different parts of it, and how you fit in to different parts of it as well, because that will open up your um, your career horizon. You may you may see that you actually want to develop into a different different sector, a different part, or a different function. Um, but even if you don't, it will still make you give you a better understanding of of your own function, of your own job in your own sector and how it's all, all working. And that will become very evident uh, to your managers as well. And, uh, you know, they will appreciate the fact that you're, you're not just turning up at, to nine to five, doing what you're being told uh, and then going home. And I'd also encourage people to in, join industry associations as well. You know, go to meetings after work, talk to other people from other, other companies uh, or other sectors, you yeah. uh, go to presentations, do lots of things which actually at the end of the day, you probably think, you know, oh, you know, I've done a hard day. I, the last thing I want to do is go out in the evening to uh, to another presentation or to a meeting or do or social networking event. But actually, you know, when you're young, push yourself to do that because you will meet people. Um, I, I still know people. You know, 30 years on who I met at, uh, at social networking events when I was in my in my mid to, to early 20s and they've been such amazing mentors to me and they've opened doors to me which I would never have done if if I'd have just uh, if I had just gone home and, and watched television or do whatever people social media for the re for the rest of the day you know and talking about that there is no replacement there's no substitute for actually meeting people face to face. I know it's difficult over the last two years or so with COVID, but so uh, when you can meet people, build relationships and uh, and that, that will be uh, fantastic for you. Yeah, that resonates a lot. Um, and talking about this 360 um, degree, let's say, overview within your industry, which is a very vast industry that might also lead us to also clapping our hands for truck drivers, for example, and not only for the people in the health industry, right? Because I mean, truck riders, uh, I think there is a, a huge lack of them, by the way, uh, in, yeah. in Europe. So, <clears throat> and talking about people again, uh, John, uh, something which is also probably just a buzzword or a very posh word these days, but with filled with a lot of meaning, what is um, diversity, uh, let's say, 
connecting? Uh, uh, what do you connect with diversity? How, how is it really important in your industry as well? Yeah, well, um, diver is, is, is hugely important. If you just go back to what you're saying about truck drivers, you know, 1% of the uh, truck driver community for HGVs, large goods vehicles, uh, etc., is uh, are, are female. You know, there are women drivers. So There's only one percent, and um, oh, wow. it's, and this is part of, of the problem. Um, but it's it's a complex issue. You know, it's easy to for companies to say yes, we're going to focus on diversity. It's easy for them to put it in their annual report, um, and it's e easy for governments as well to to fly that flag for diversity. What's more difficult, and why there's a truck driver shortage, and one of the reasons a truck driver shortage is, is say investment in um, proper uh, secure truck stops, for example, just one, one area, you have better hygiene facilities. You know, it, for, for too long, this is this has been you know, forgotten about by policy made <laughs> by the industry itself. Uh, and they've just been been happy to let standards slip and slip and slip. And, and of course, one of the key reasons which surveys have shown that women do not want to become a become a truck driver is because of the issues over security. You know, whereas many truck, many male truck drivers are happy just laying up in a, in a overnight um, in a lay by by the side of the road. You know, many women are not for very good reasons, you know, for many good security reasons. So but if there are no proper truck stops, then they don't have that uh, that option. So it is this is uh, there are real practical uh, investment decisions to be made uh, both by governments and by industry. To if this term diversity is not just to be some sort of you know nice buzzword where everybody says yeah isn't it fantastic we'll, we'll, we'll have far more diversity and and so on it's meaningless unless you actually make those decisions and and put that policy um, in, into uh, in um, into practice yeah so talking. Um about another um, very important uh, topic uh, in any industry, but probably especially also in the supply chain industry, is um, about disruption, innovation. I'm pretty sure your students uh, need also to be aware and dare to be disruptive and innovative. Um, connected to this, um, and this is where also companies need to support this, um, is the, the term, let's say, failing or learn how to fail, because you need to dare to, to be innovative and then inevitably you will fail. Um, is this something you also touch upon during your lectures or you observe in, in your touch points with the industry? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, and I think this is where um, if you look at the, the US, for example, they, they have a culture where sort of failure is seen as a step towards success. Whereas in certainly in, in parts of Europe and maybe other parts of the world, you know, failure is, is seen as an end in itself. You know, so if if you have a you may have a great idea, but you may not have the backing, or you're you may be at uh, ahead of your time, and uh, you don't you don't even get the sort of co uh, customer engagement or, or whatever it is. There may be many many good reasons that uh, that your idea uh, fails, and but in as I'm saying, in parts of the world that means that's a stop, and you just say right. I failed and that will live with you for the rest of your life and you'll go back and do to, to work for another company or whatever. But what in, in America is, is, is so exciting and why they have uh, they do so well in terms of tech startups and yeah, so many unicorns and uh, all, all the rest of it is the fact that, you know, they recognize the fact that um, so-called failure is a learning experience and you can only really become successful after you've 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 had maybe maybe several of those learning experiences are on on the road one of the also the good things that um, best practices is how to learn to fail quickly so therefore uh, if you should always be very self-critical and testing your new idea uh, against many different criteria against what customers are wanting and maybe financial criteria as well and if you see 
that there are there is um, uh, uh, friction or headwinds and you th you think well that you should be able to think right that's not it's not going to work at this particular time let's shut it down let's try something else but let's take on those let's take the learning from that experience in, in order to um, to frame and develop your new startup and your new initiative and i think i think that's that's absolutely critical it's very much easier said than done though because many people uh, when they have a startup, they have so much emotional investment in it. It's not just a financial investment, but it becomes their life. And therefore, they become fixated on actually making it work. And they, they'll probably run with that for, for many months, many years, too long. And then, the, then of course, the, the failure becomes critical to them as a, as a human being, as well as a, as, as a business venture. And uh, that will probably... Uh, then influence the rest of their their life. But if they're able to look at things more dispassionately, see it as just purely as a business a business idea, uh, an innovation, work out whether it's working or not. If if it's not, then shut it down and think of different ways of approaching that same that same problem. I've even um, noticed that some companies, uh, probably some of the more innovative ones, have been incentivizing failure even uh, at a certain degree. Um, so I'm almost uh, um, coming to my last question, which is also, I think, very much related to innovation. And I would be very interested to know, John, um, I mean, Another, let's say, uh, buzzword or trend uh, nowadays, which will not go away, I think, is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see, um, let's say, opportunities uh, within the supply chain industry and artificial intelligence, if they are? Uh, the, it, it's going to impact on every single part of the supply chain. Um, firstly, in terms of Big data, you know, the the industry is nothing if it's not the data which is being moved around at the same time as the as the, the freight or the, the packages. You know, every package comes with you know huge amounts of metadata about what's inside, what the freight is, uh, the conditions it's being stored in, where it is in in the world, and if you multiply that by many tens of millions or billions, then you get an idea of the amount of data which is. Uh, which is flowing around the world at, at any one time and that's far too much data for for a human to be able to process and then make make decisions on and so ai that's where really one of the, the main benefits of ai is that it will uh, so-called machine learning will will actually be able to make decisions uh, be able to filter all this data and actually make those uh, execute on those decisions far far more effectively than, than humans will ever be able to. But to give you another example, which is um, uh, very relevant in today's uh, today's market, you know, the, uh, the use of robotics uh, in uh, in warehouses. Uh, you know, all being controlled by AI in terms of where different packages should be put put down, put around the warehouse, when they should be taken out, how they should be packed, and where they should be dispatched. That will all require elements of of AI, and um, that's also it's an opportunity in some way, but it's also a threat because uh, the warehousing industry uh, employs millions of people around the world, uh, have, and that's. That's a threat to many companies because if you look at COVID and the impact that that's that's had on uh, warehouse operations, you know sometimes it's shut down whole warehouses. Uh, mm -hmm. In so so there is this sort of push to automate uh, and uh, bring more robotics. You know Amazon has been the best example of this, but there are lots and lots of e-commerce companies who are who are also deploying this technology in order to reduce their reliance on, on humans. So we're going to see a workforce which is changing dramatically over the next 10 years in terms of uh, terms of structure. You know it, we will see there far more focus on the technology on the value adding side of it, far less focus on people being paid to take a package, put it somewhere in a warehouse and then get that package, then pack it, oh, then wrap it and then uh, you know, put it on, on a truck. You know, I can easily say, you see in 10 years, 
that the numbers of people employed in warehousing will have dramatically fallen as more and more warehouses become automated. So it's AI and other technological innovations, big opportunity uh, for in terms of increasing value, but also a big threat to uh, to large swathes of uh, of uh, industrial labor. So do I conclude correctly, John, that the best way, the best uh, approach to protect yourself um, from being threatened by, you know, by being replaced by a machine is to go into your lecture and study and continue to uh, lifelong learning? Absolutely, uh, Paco. That's uh, that's um, not just my lecture, I have to say, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the the. <clears throat> The, there are some fantastic courses right around the world, the world now, and that's one of the big things that, uh, that I've seen change in the last uh, 30 years since when I, I, when I went back to university and did uh, MSc in transport planning and management. There weren't any logistics courses around there, and that was one of the few um, that uh, had a logistics course. Uh, now, uh, a lot of universities around the world will will have logistics and supply chain courses, and that will be that would be the, the first step. You know, um, inc increase the, the yeah, look at qualifications, increase your value, find out where you fit in within the industry, and once you've picked a chosen course, you know, stick to it, become very dedicated to to that, and then you will be able to demonstrate the, the value you, you can bring to your company. If you want to set up your own company, really encourage you to do that uh, as well. There are so many different opportunities within the industry at the moment that uh, you know you should grasp them with with both hands. So excellent. So um, closing the third the, the circle, one thing is to have that value, but also to being able to communicate and present that value to your future employees. So, John, thank you very much for this very insightful conversation. I wish you a peaceful and healthy pre-Christmas period. I'm really looking forward to talking with you again. Thank you very much, Paki. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.